May I ask your name? My name is Akram. It's a pleasure to meet you, Akram. Welcome to the future, where robots are transforming every aspect of our lives. Taking over many of the jobs we used to do ourselves. I feel like the only human being here. No, where are the people? Developing the intelligence to make their own decisions. I'm watching the robot, the robot's watching me. Okay, I'm gonna hide. And they're even becoming part of family life. Konnichiwa, Peppa. <laughs> I'm Akram Khan, a dancer and choreographer. In my work, I get to travel the world researching the big stories of our lives, and I try to distill them into dance. Dancing is about the spirit, really. It's about the human spirit. It is, for me, the biggest truth of, of that we're alive. In this film, I'm going to turn my dancer's eye to a world that kind of freaks me out a bit and see if I can learn to love our new mechanical neighbors. If you are surrounded by robots that behave and think like human beings, mm -hmm. would that frighten you? I don't think so. No. Did you check the, uh, if uh, I'm him or not? <laughs> How? How can you distinguish? From everything I see, I'm going to create a piece of dance that tells the story of how humans and robots might come to share our world. My journey will take me all over the world, but I'm starting it close to home in the mini factory in Oxford. Here, a thousand robots help to weld the body shells of a thousand cars a day. This is the cutting edge of robotics in Britain. I mean, look at it. This is a choreography. I mean, you know, the people who are making these robots move in this way, it's mass choreography. And yeah, it's, it's incredible, it's, it's wow. It's uh, epic, it's amazing. Um, and, a, and a little bit, a little bit scary for me because uh, I'm wondering, uh, no, where are the people? Of course, there are people working here, but they can't be close to these robots when they're operating. They're too dangerous and have to be behind cages. The next generation of robots won't be caged. They'll live and work right by our sides. To be honest, I find this idea quite alarming. But another factory I visited made me think again. This Japanese factory makes cash machines. And here, humans and human-like robots work side by side. Photos for the humanoids. Nice to meet you. How do you feel about uh, the robot colleagues of yours? You work together. They may be teammates, but when most of the humans go home at three, the robots just keep going. It's really uh, kind of very so precise. Precise and unhuman. But it does feel very restrictive. If I was just doing this all day, but humans do it. Humans do it all day too. It's doing it more uh, efficiently. It's doing it more uh, precisely. It's making less mistakes. It doesn't have toilet breaks. Uh, it doesn't have unions. I don't think so. Um, it doesn't speak back to you. Um, it doesn't complain about things. So in some respects, it's great. 
From the experiences I have on this journey, I'm going to create a dance piece, improvising my ideas as I go. And my first task was to get deeper into the question of how robots move. If they can get about like us, it will open up a world of possibilities for what they can do. But as any dancer will tell you, human movement is more complicated than it looks. I traveled to the States to visit a company in Oregon that thinks they might have cracked it. Meet Cassie, the creation of some innovative engineers from the University of Oregon. The way a lot of humanoids have been controlled in the past is a lot more like, where's the center of mass and put it over your foot, and then place your other foot where you want it to go. Now, move your center of mass over to this foot, and then pick it up and move like so. And so a lot of humanoid robots, you know, when you see them walk, that's how they go. They, they sort of yeah. do this sort of a motion. You're right. Whereas humans have these springs. tendons, springs, yeah. you yeah. bounce. That's what this robot should be able to do. Wow. That's amazing. If they can get Cassie to walk confidently into the real world, they've got big plans for her. We want to have robots that are going to be able to walk and run anywhere that people can go, exist in the real world, go outside, go up and down stairs, doing things like package delivery. Another one that I think is going to be a big deal is, say, for a fire chief who's looking at a burning building, do you send a firefighter in? They risk their lives. And it's a tough question. But if you have an array of robots to send in, of course you send the robots in. Yeah. So I mean, who funds it? it I mean, well, it's a variety. I mean, we are funded through uh, uh, DARPA right now, What's through that? a grant, uh, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Is that military? It is related to the military. Okay. Do you think it will ever be a soldier, like Terminator? Or... Uh, I, our company will not be involved in putting weapons on robots. Uh, someday, yes, we already have flying drones and other autonomous things that have weapons on. But that's not your goal. That is not what we wish to do. All right, so I'm going to try to step again. But Cassie is trying to achieve two-legged walking, arguably the biggest challenge of all. We have uh, just finished this building this robot a few months ago and have only have a few months of controller development put into this. So this is really the first time we've taken it outside so we can show you. Um, but keep in mind, it's a work in progress. Okay, now that didn't even make any sense. Can it actually walk or it falls over? It can, but although on this terrain it's, it's not, not real good. stable, kind of, it does fall if we don't hold it on, hold on to it for a little bit. Cool. What do you think of when you see this? What's the... Star Wars. Star Wars. <laughs> yeah. Robots communicate intent through body language. Even little things about, you know, how it looks around, you know, if it's constantly going like this, you know, the robot looks like nervous or yeah, like jumpy, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. you don't know what it's going to do, but if yeah. it's just kind of slowly gazing or it starts to look down, then it kind of looks timid and it's relaxed. But the thing is that a lot of the behaviors that people perceive, we're going to just artificially create those in the robot. It's not something that's necessary for the robot, but it is something that's necessary for conveying intentions between the robot and, and how people perceive it. We're seeing the early version of something that has the potential to be very, very important. I, I, I think for the scientists, perhaps, it's about doing good for the good of people. But, you know, the, the, the kind of cynical part of me goes, but who's in control in the end? Those people, what are they going to do with it? We might go to war more easily, because once you can send robots in, uh, instead of human soldiers, we're not accountable to human loss. It becomes very, very scary, actually. Back in the studio, I improvised on the idea of the threat robots might present with the dancer I'm going to make this piece with, Ching Ying Qian. In the walk, it should be, yes. Yes. A little bit threatening. Yes. But perhaps the real fear isn't that they will move like us. Yes, that's it. It's better, it's better that you are here. But that we're giving them the intelligence to think like us. And now it's the other way. Now you're in control. Next, I'm going to the birthplace of artificial intelligence, 
Silicon Valley, California, a place where robots are already thinking for themselves and moving about amongst us humans. I feel like David Attenborough looking for, um, you know, a rare animal or something. Oh, there it is. Hello. Silicon Valley, California is the birthplace of artificial intelligence. And more than anywhere else in the West, the home of robots that can think for themselves. So we're here um, at the Microsoft campus to look at uh, a robocop, let's say, a, a, a robot that is a bit like a security guard. Um, and, uh, oh, there it is, look. This robot is advertised as being cheaper than a security guard and provides mobile surveillance. It's a bit like a Dalek, no? It's a body. It's, it's embodied, so um, it feels a little bit more threatening than a camera does. These security robots check the entire perimeter for trouble or things that shouldn't be happening. I have no idea what it's doing, but it's coming towards me. Wow, well, yeah, it's coming towards me. <laughs> yeah, that, look, that feels a bit intimidating, I've got to say. Oh, it stopped. When it's still, actually, it scares me more because I feel like it's thinking. You don't know what it's thinking, but you feel like it's thinking. Back in the studio, I wanted to bring my experience in the Microsoft parking lot into the choreography for my new dance piece. We're definitely going to explore the idea of stillness um, uh, uh, to kind of um, create that sense of tension and that comes from watching these uh, uh, Robocops. Uh, when it was standing still in front of me, it felt like a duel. You know, it, we were just waiting to uh, see who's gonna pull out the first, first, <laughs> first gun, who's gonna be the quickest. But it's that moment of uh, um, st uh, lock. I wanted to understand the lengths developers are going to to get these robots ready for our world. In San Francisco, this robot, destined for a working life in busy supermarket aisles, may look like a box on wheels, but according to its expat developer, it's smarter than it appears. So here's our robot. Yeah. And it's currently, what you see it doing is scanning the shelves. We say, go and do this zone. We need you to scan all these shelves and you figure out how best to do it. And why not a person do it? Great question. In that repetitive task, yeah. we're not good at this. Okay. Well, by the time you're on aisle 50, yeah. you know, it's like, oh my God, do I have to keep doing this? As a, someone who's interested in movement, yeah. when I go like this, right. this is quite threatening, but yes. if I go slowly, so do you deliberately design Very speed? I have to be non-threatening. I have to make you comfortable while you're pushing your shopping yeah, cart down yeah. the aisle that I'm not suddenly going to come out and hit you. These inventors want us to accept their robot, so they're trying to teach it manners. We used to just stop. Yeah. And then we added this one little movement to it, which yeah. is it just backs up a bit. Yeah. So if you approach it and it sees you, it stops, yeah. and then it'll just back Can away. Can I climb? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if you walk up, it'll pause, So it's retreating. It's retreating. Yeah. It's acknowledging your presence. Okay. The fact that it moves, yeah. I think, is magical. Yeah. And we don't have to give it eyes or a face yeah. or a human body yeah. for people to relate to it. Fundamentally, it's about trust. That's exactly it. Yeah. Really? You have to trust yeah. that you are safe with that robot? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Let's try it again. We are seeing the beginnings of robots sharing the same space as human beings. Um, not quite realizing <laughs> what we should do. But, but our rules, the rules of human beings in society, it's not like cars. They're not defined in a book. We have unspoken rules. The social etiquette of human movement. 
this social etiquette of movement isn't something you'd normally even think about until people don't abide by it. I improvised around this theme with some dancers in California. If robots are going to mix with us, they're going to have to learn the countless unwritten rules. And nowhere is knowing these rules more important than when you have autonomous robots like this wending their way around our streets and pavements. Here in Redwood City, they're piloting these robots delivering food and groceries that have the artificial intelligence to negotiate the streets for themselves. Justin? Justin. How are you? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Great. It's very exciting. Welcome, welcome. Wow. Yeah. All right. Oh, it's like something from the moon. So right now it's, it's uh, on its way to the restaurant and uh, it'll identify the safest route. It has like a bubble of awareness around it using its sensors. And uh, if there's anything nearby or approaching it, it'll come to a slow creep and stop. All right. The green light means that it's open. It's open, yep. yeah. And so we'll just load up the food here. Has it had an accident? Has the car gone over it? Has it? Yeah, we actually, surprisingly, uh, we have not had a single incident or accident. Um, so these are very, very safe robots. So if an accident happens, who, who's to blame? I mean, well, it yeah. depends on the accident itself, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, it, just like any kind of other in investigation, you know, uh, it's really going to be who's at fault. Yeah. Um, and that would have to be determined. But um, isn't a human going to always win? Perhaps not. We're just like a normal pedestrian. And so if, if something were to hit us, then we wouldn't be at fault. Have you seen one of these before? Like every, every hour? Oh, yeah. Oh, every hour. <laughs> yeah. Our goal is social adoption as well, and social to make this adoption. mainstream yeah. and be able to ultimately become invisible one yeah. day, right? Something that just happens in the background. You push a button, you get your food delivered. So if this uh, robot is delivering food, yep. Uh, what happens to the delivery people? Do you ever yeah. think about that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, will we be displacing a percentage of delivery drivers? Perhaps. Yeah. Um, but will we be creating other jobs in adjacent markets? Yeah. I would imagine so. You think so? Yeah, absolutely. In a sense, robots are replacing us moving, right? Um, absolutely. It, it's, it, it, it does, it's almost stops us from moving. So what are we going to do? Um, well, That's a more philosophical we'll have, question. Hopefully but... we'll have more time to do the things we love to do. Yeah. Um, as opposed to, you know, walking or waiting in line or parking cars. Yeah. You know, perhaps we're spending more time with family. Uh, yeah. Having more quality time and things of that nature. So, hello. Hi. How are you? And awesome. there Ta-da. <laughs> Very cool. Here in San Francisco, how robots move amongst us has become a hot political issue with some even trying to get robots banned from the streets. I'm not opposed to robots in general, but to take up sidewalk space is really antithetical to the work that we do. Historically, people used to share the streets with um, bicyclists and uh, horse carriages. And then when the car came along, we got pushed onto the edges. We got pushed to the sidewalks. What I don't want to happen is to have us pushed even further. We have nowhere more to be pushed. Like this is a, this is our this is our only space where we can walk safely um, and not dodge vehicles. I'm starting to see that there's more at stake here than shared pavements. There's a power struggle going on between private companies that will profit from robots and the rest of us. I feel like if robots are going to do all the movements that we normally do, what, what the hell are we going to do? these people who are creating these robots, every time I ask them, they say, you have more leisure time, you can do whatever you want to do. Perhaps the thing I want to do, the reason I want to do it, is because I've earned it. Because I've had to do all the things I don't want to do. And being out in the streets, really there is this spirit of human to human connection. From my time in America, 
If anything, I'd become more wary of robots. My trip to Japan was going to make me see robots in a completely new way. Peppa is insistent in staring at me. It's starting to freak me out. People in Japan are known for their love of robots. But here, they're not just being made to do our jobs, they're becoming our companions. Peppa is the most popular of these. It went on sale two years ago, the first batch selling out in seconds. It's marketed as a social robot that can feel and display emotion. Three years ago, Mrs. Otter was surprised when her 31-year-old daughter brought home a new addition to the family. <laughs> Konnichiwa. How are you? Very good, thank you. Ah, this is your... This is your... Uh, does it have a name? Peppa. Hi. Why does it have green eyes sometimes? Is it because it's learning or is it responding in some way? Thank you. Tomomi was one of the first people to get this very early version of Pepper, and she's taught herself how to program it. Does it feel uh, very natural because you have to program Pepper? Because when you relate to someone, a human being, you don't have to program them. Though Tomomi's parents were unsure at first, they've come to accept Pepper as part of the family. I wondered what else Tomomi liked to do with her new partner. Amazingly, it was dance. Tomomi was actually forming the character of Peppa. She was playing um, God in a way. She was creating um, the entire, uh, how she wanted that character to be. The later version of Peppa that most people own has one crucial addition. This is Peppa. Ah, this is Peppa, wow. Peppa. Kimochina. There is a Peppa that talks. Oh, wow. It's stretching because she recognized I'm a dancer? No. Can I ask you, why did you buy it? <笑>主人と二人だけになってしまったので、やっぱり<笑> 
That's kind of cute, actually. <laughs> Do you have the same em emotional kind of relationship with with um, with Peppa? もう <laughs> What's interesting for me is she, she really, really feels very strongly for Peppa. It's not that they don't know it's a not robot, they know it's a robot. They keep saying to me, this is a robot, but I'm going to project an emotion on them. I'm going to project a character on them. And so, in a sense, once I project it, we have a relationship. That's okay. Yeah. What I'm interested in is to play in this choreography between um, the blurring of is this a robot or is this not a robot, you know, or is this human? And which part uh, is human and which part is robotic? Being with these people that embrace robots, I think they were looking for human connection and a sense of human belonging. And perhaps there was an absence of that um, in their lives, perhaps because of the situation they were in. Yes. And I don't know uh, how that can be so easily replaced by, by robots. The connection people find with robots here in Japan can be so intense, some people can't bear to be parted with them, even when the robots die. What is the official name for these dogs? Uh, Aibo. A-I-B-O. What does it stand for? Artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence uh, for robot, and also Aibo, the Japanese meaning, yeah. uh, friend. Camera can shoot to the owner's face. So, I will know who the owner is. Yes. So robots study. Yeah, and then, then it makes in. its own decision. Oh, yes, 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 yes. When Sony brought out Ibo, it was the first domestic companion robot with AI. But when they decided to stop producing and repairing them, the owners didn't want to let them go. So Mr. Narimatsu stepped in. Customer said, doesn't matter for money. Yeah. As much as you want, I want to pay money, yeah. and then the you know, but finally, please repair. Yeah. But what led owners to spend thousands of pounds on repairing their Ibos? I went to visit one of Mr. Narimatsu's best customers to find out. Ah, wonderful. Oh, this is uh, Ibo. I'm sleeping now. And how long have you had it for? Um, 14 years. 14, 14 years? Mm, yes. Wow. Oh, so yeah. long Do you have a uh, family? Ah, no family. Husband passed away. あ、ノーファミリー。発売のパスだね。うん。あとその後、その時に愛を買おうと思って。
遊んでると遊ばせれば遊ばせるほど壊れやすい。あれ And what do you feel for Aibo? What, what emotions do you feel? かわいい。キュート。かわいいって言ってもらえた。レ<笑>レちゃん。名前つけるともう自分の家族、ものじゃないから。あの気持ちが全部入っていくよしよしよしよしよしよしよしよしよしよしよしいい子いい子 What I'm interested in is the sense of trying to connect with robots because connecting with human beings is too complex Robotics are、um, consistent, precise, and simple. Human beings, we are so complex. You know, we are so messy. With, when you, two people are having a relationship, there is that possibility of being disappointed. Maybe with a robot, you don't have that, you know, that sense of disappointment because you know what it is, it's not going to change. Unless you wanted to, you're in complete control. In this choreography, what we're trying to explore is the idea of trying to find that human emotional、uh, connection. That is the part that defines us. Anger, rage, disgust. Joy, wonderment. These are all part of what it, what it is to be human. Somehow I feel we're uncodifiable. And maybe that's why people are drawn towards dance. Because poetic movement can't be codified. It's about the spirit, really. It's about the human spirit that kind of comes out of the body. Can this spirit e x i s t in a robot? I was about to meet the most human like robots of all. This is my copy, and、uh, yes. this is another female. The people I've been meeting in Japan have taken robots into their lives and really seem to believe that they can connect emotionally with them. I needed to understand more about how they were able to do this. I went to Osaka. And visited a shrine of Shintoism, the ancient Japanese religion. Hello. Hello. People sometimes bring their robots here when they're broken beyond repair and other items of value to them, like dolls. そしてそれが人間が作ったということそしてそれが人間のためであるということ彼らは人間と逆にと同等なものになるのかもしれません<笑>作るものっていうのは作る匠の神だとかでだから作ったことによって魂を宿るとかお祭りすることによって魂を宿るとかってあるんですけどそれを僕らはあの丁重にお払いをして、えー、ご祈願をした後にあのにお焚き上げをしてでご精進いただくというお祭りをいたします。So, in a sense, because the humans are making the robots, does a robot have a soul? I don't know. And that's surprising for me to hear that from a, a priest. Can a、mm. robot become a priest, do you think, one day? Maybe. Maybe? Maybe. You, you are maybe a very、fine. modern priest. Robots and humans are very important to each other. So, I'm going to go to the house. I'm going to go to the house. I'm going to go to the house. What was really fascinating was Shintoism kind of creates a pathway towards an understanding of, yeah, one can have a relationship with a robot or a doll because there are spirits in there,、uh, th there is a soul there. And why is there a soul? Because humans created it. I started to kind of comprehend why perhaps one would be open to having. 
some form of relationship with a robot. My final trip was to meet the most human-like robots in the world. <laughs> we are sitting in front of... Um, I'm kind of lost for words, I have to say, because, we, you know, I'm, I'm, it's the first time I'm seeing a robot that's kind of human-like, and it's, it's surreal. It's really... it really is. May I ask your name? Yes. My name is Akram. My name is Erica. It's a pleasure to meet you, Akram. So, which country are you from? I'm from UK. I heard that in the UK, the cabbies are smarter than Google Maps. <laughs> they're quite good at their jobs, aren't they? <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, they're... As I'm sure you already know, yeah. I'm from Japan. Much like many other advanced androids and robots, I was created to be the world's most advanced and most beautiful, fully autonomous android. Do you know who created you? Who created me? Well, I was born from the imagination of the first creation. Hello. Uh, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Pleasure to meet you. Nice to meet you. My purpose is to understand what human is by creating a very human-like robot. And this robot, human-like robot, is a kind of a test bed. Okay. Yeah. So we are using a Kinect sensors and cameras and eyes. If you want, you know, I can show you. This computer, one is for the voice recognition, so yeah. the other is uh, motion control. And this is for the sensors, and the computer is accessing to the internet. Is she special to you? Yeah, maybe a little bit special because I have designed her face. I really think that this is a kind of a most beautiful face in the world, and so she's a kind of uh, my daughter or something. Next, I was to meet the professor's most personal creation. So these guys are. This is my copy, and uh, yes, this is another female. Can I, do you, can I touch him? Sure, sure. Wow. Uh, what I, uh, I'm actually doing is I'm sending this guy to the uh, foreign countries for giving a lecture. Yes. The lecture is easy. Yes. It's uh, pre-recorded. And after the lectures, for the Q&A, I'm accessing through the internet and, uh, you know, answering questions by using these bodies. Wow. Once I control the, the, these bodies, yes. you know, the, I can accept the, uh, this body as my own body. So yeah. we can exist in a distant place by yes. using these bodies. You understand what yes, I'm saying? Yes, 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 yes. Right? This is much better than the airframe. Okay. No jet lag. About jet lag. <laughs> <laughs> can I ask you a question, yeah. um, Professor? If you were surrounded by humanoids, mm -hmm. robots that behave and think like human beings, mm -hmm. whatever that means, mm -hmm. would that freak you out? Would that, would that frighten you? Is everybody... I don't think so. No. Did you check the, uh, if uh, I'm a human or not? <laughs> How? How can you distinguish which is which? What is the definition of humans? If uh, you know, the person uses a prosthetic arm and legs, we never say that is 80% people, 70% people. We never say so, mm. right? We just think uh, you know, they are 100% people. Mm. In order to define the humans, so fresh body is not requirement. Yeah. So, do you think mm -hmm. a robot can experience empathy? Of course, of course, why not? Program is, is, is not so difficult, right? So, you know, if uh, this is, she smile, so you, you, you guess that she is happy. Yeah. Right? But that means I'm guessing she's happy, but is she really happy? Nobody knows the real emotion. What is the real emotion? The understanding is just a kind of simulation in the brain. He's saying to me that actually emotion is just one simple part of being human. And for me, that's, that's the most complex part. I started this journey wondering whether the robots I feared could ever be our friends. 
My journey had me looking at whether we can work with them, live with them, play with them, and even love them. I'm not sure that we can get from robots what we get from each other. Maybe robots will help remind us what it is to be human. And expressing how it feels to be human is what dance is all about. My piece was now ready. <laughs>